Good evening, everyone. My name is Scott Myers from the Department of Communication Studies, and we are pleased uh, to co-sponsor tonight's um, program titled Energy in the Environment Communication Challenges, which is a public program of the National Communication Association. Um, tonight, we have Dr. Lakeisha Anderson, who is the Director of Academic and Professional Affairs at NCA, who will introduce the panelists, and she'll also serve as the moderator. So welcome, Lakeisha, and the panelists to WVO. As Scott said, my name is Lakeisha Anderson. I'm the Director of Academic and Professional Affairs at the National Communication Association. And we're here to have a conversation about how energy, um, in, energy conversations impact communities and the individuals who live in those communities. So I'm just going to let them go down and kind of inter introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about what they do and what their research is like. Um, so I'll let you start, Pete. Okay. Um, I'm Pete Pazumik. I'm from James Madison University in the School of Communication Studies. And uh, I study environmental communication. Uh, I write a lot with a writing team. Uh, my colleagues, Steve Schwartz, Jennifer Schneider, and Jennifer Peoples. And uh, several years ago, I got interested in um, writing about the coal industry and the rhetoric of the coal industry while I was teaching a capstone course on um, mountaintop removal for our environmental studies program. And uh, I guess I'll be sharing some of the things that came out of that project. My name is Brian Ballantyne. I'm the chairperson for the Department of English. Um, I was hired uh, to uh, WVU back in Ooh, 2006, so it's been a few years. Um, I was initially hired to coordinate our professional writing and editing program. My background is in technical and professional communication um, and the intersections of rhetoric. Um, I got particularly interested in um, environmental communication when about, oh gosh, it's been about seven years now. Um, I, I became a landowner in Southeast Ohio, specifically Belmont County, Ohio. And um, that area sits squarely over the Utica and Marcellus Shale regions. And um, I own a relatively small 40-acre parcel in that, in that region. And I um, uh, was invited to, uh, by a couple of colleagues who were um, co-editing a special issue of communication design quarterly on environmental communication. It should be out any day now. It's supposed to be out by now. Uh, it's supposed to be the first issue of the um, uh, of the calendar year, so, uh, and that um, that article de details some of my experience as a as a landowner in in that region and some of the um, well um, the rhetorical strategies that I've taken on as um, somebody who is um, now dealing with um, oil and gas companies and um, a landowner group that I joined uh, early on to um, basically compete with the rhetoric of large oil and gas companies, which you can imagine is, is, is um, a substantial force. So I'm happy to share any of those experiences with you. Uh, good evening. My name is Emily Corio. Uh, I'm a journalism professor here at the College of Media at West Virginia University. Um, prior to jo joining the college uh, in 2011, I was a journalist, um, and I worked in West Virginia as a journalist for 10 years, um, covering uh, a lot of issues. Um, but uh, a lot of environmental and energy stories as well. And now here um, at the college, I'm leading a special reporting project where last year we focused on covering um, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and um, trying to tell that story so that we uh, you know, didn't just drill it down, sorry for the pun, mm -hmm. into uh, jobs versus the environment, which is sometimes a pitfall of... Uh, of uh, environmental reporting. So um, I'm happy to be here tonight to talk to you about uh, my experience. I'm Lou Martin, and I'm a labor historian from Chatham University in Pittsburgh. I grew up in the northernmost part of West Virginia near uh, Weirton, Hancock County. And um, my first book was on rural industrial workers of Hancock County in the 20th century. And in 2011, I participated in a protest march, uh, the March on Blair Mountain, which um, brought me to southern West Virginia, 
we walked 50 miles uh, from Marmette down to Blair Mountain through a lot of coal towns and saw firsthand how divided many of these communities were over this issue. A couple years later, I joined with uh, seven other people to start the West Virginia Mine Wars Museum. And that opened in 2015. It's going very well. They made all of us honorary members of Local 1440 of the United Mine Workers, inmate one. And uh, I've written two pieces recently. One was about the image of the noble coal miner that has often been evoked by politicians for their purposes, a variety of purposes. And um, more recently, I uh, co-authored an article about the coal industry's rhetoric, and I relied, um, or we, we relied a lot on the work of a guy named Pete Zumick and three other authors, and uh, lo and behold, I got to meet him tonight. <laughs> Didn't know that until, until tonight, but yeah, so that's my story. Well, that's great. I'm excited that you guys could meet. <laughs> All right, so how we're going to do this is we'll talk for about an hour. I have prepared questions for them, and we'll have a conversation about some of these issues, and then there'll be 30 minutes at the end for questions. So at that time, if you have questions, if you could raise your hand, we'll get to you. So, All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. So we know West Virginia to be one of the highest producing coal states, and there has been an uptick, especially in the past few years, about environmental, environmental conversations and climate change. Uh, before we get into how those conversations have impacted communication about energy, I'm wondering if you can tell me a bit about the dialogue around the environment and um, energy and how what that's currently like and how it's changed over time, if it has. Not just here in West Virginia, but globally. Anybody can start. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to hear what, this issue of jobs versus the environment. Yeah. And it seems like that's been a, a reoccurring frame. It is. And yeah. I'd like to hear your perspective as a journalist on that, if you don't mind. Well, yeah, I don't think that's changed. I think that that is generally what, what it does get boiled down to, which is unfortunate because you miss the complexities of the story. Um, but I, I do think that there are some um, ways that we're kind of combating that in journalism. I don't know if any of you read Ken Ward's articles. Um, if you follow him, but he's working with ProPublica right now um, through a local reporting project. Um, they're actually um, paying a salary, I believe, for one or two years for him to just focus on the gas drilling industry in West Virginia and covering that. And um, that, that allows him to focus on just this issue and really get into some of the um, stories that might not otherwise be reported if, uh, you know, this was just a topic that that a general assignment reporter had to cover along with everything else they have to cover. Um, some of those stories might get missed. So I think that that's a, a recent collaborative project, one example of um, something that's, uh, that, that's combating that just its jobs versus the environment. Um, and I should note, too, where I used to work, West Virginia Public Broadcasting also has a, um, a partnership that, that it's focused on with the Ohio Valley Resource Network, which is out of Kentucky, uh, but that is supported by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And uh, that allows West Virginia Public Broadcasting to play stories from this other network. So, so it basically gives them more coverage of the region that they can air on their network. So again, Another example of a collaborative reporting project that's allowing for more um, in-depth coverage of uh, environmental issues, of energy issues that are impacting West Virginia. And can I just follow up with that? Yeah, sure. So what do you think the responsibility of journalists is to that conversation? Yeah. Um, well, uh, you know, journalists get into trouble, um, I have uh, seen, when they just kind of drop into a community and try to cover something. Um, I covered the Sago mine disaster um, many years ago, and I remember uh, walking into a, a store in, uh, I believe it was um, downtown uh, Bealington, and um, I had been on the story for many days. Um, 
and you know, driving from Morgantown to these communities, and this woman who was working in the store looked at me. Um, I think I asked, you know, could I interview you? And she said, go home. We don't want you here anymore. And, um, and I said, well, uh, this is kind of home. <laughs> you know, I only live 45 minutes down the road. Um, but it, it has stuck with me that you can't, you know, drop into these communities and uh, try to cover these issues without getting to know the community um, and putting everything into context. And so I think that's the obligation journalists have, is to get to know a community so that you can put these issues into context. And um, I'm doing that with this special reporting project um, that uh, is with George Washington University. So we, um, we collaborate with uh, George Washington University students from Washington Washington, D.C., come here, work with my students from WVU, and um, we cover topics in an in-depth way. And they see the importance of, you know, coming to a community and really getting to know it um, so that you cover it um, in a complete way. Can I add? Um, one former coal miner uh, wrote that the companies used the miners to dig the coal, but also to eliminate regulations. And what he meant by that was that the companies would often hold up the employed miners as the reasons for eliminating regulation and also sponsor bus trips to state capitals in Washington, D.C. for lobbying. But one of the things that that has a tendency to do then is to put the focus on the employed and the unemployed coal miners while management and shareholders are absent from those stories. And the result is that we don't ever get a real explanation of what the motives of the companies truly are because uh, they're not job creating organizations. That's not what their success is based on. They have a legal obligation to uh, their shareholders for profit. And so one of the things about that job versus the environment is that it sidesteps a lot of the investigation that I wish were actually done on the companies. And I guess I would add that, you know, zooming out, uh, a couple weeks ago, maybe it was last week, um, my colleagues and I got contacted by a reporter who was putting a story together about uh, Trump's new um, attack on the Green New Deal at his uh, stump speeches or rallies in Michigan, for example. And in these speeches, he's inserted um, these little snippets of demagoguery, I guess, uh, about uh, you know, honey, I really wish we could uh, watch TV tonight, but the wind has stopped blowing, so we can't watch TV. Or uh, that we, we want to take a trip, but our car can only go 240 miles on its electric charge, so I guess we won't be able to do that. And they were asking us if this isn't just uh, Trump recycling uh, coal industry talking points, and if, you know, what what's going on. And I think uh, in answering that sort of global question about with climate change and the things that are happening, you know, um, the newest Yale George Mason climate change communication studies show that there's now at least 62% of Americans who are concerned about climate change. Uh, uh, Matthew Nisbet, the editor of environmental communication recently uh, wrote in Scientific America that the the question of climate change is over, and we are pretty much on to the policy debate at this point. Uh, the new proposals from the Sunrise Movement for the Green New Deal, uh, coming from the left, on the right, there are proposals from the Climate Leadership Council, uh, James Baker, George Schultz, uh, Halstead, Ted Halstead, and they are calling for uh, attacks on carbon, and a dispersal of the dividends. There are Lamar Alexander's calling for a new Manhattan project. So in a lot of ways, even though with the current president that we have, um, it doesn't, we won't likely see much movement on that at a national level. 
There's a lot of things happening at the state level. Uh, public opinion is switching, and we are kind of on to that sort of policy debate, especially in the, in the, at the national level. Uh, and I think that's going to start to shape conversation and will probably need to shape conversation in places like West Virginia and Ohio and Pennsylvania and the fracking fields in very new ways. Yeah. I, I agree, absolutely. And I, th I think part of the challenge leading up to this point is that the, I guess you could call it a rhetorical trope of energy independence um, is so appealing and so easy to deploy as a, as a rhetorical tactic um, of, on the part of politicians. And it certainly fits in with a nationalist, even arguably protectionist position um, that we have in our upper administration at this point in time. And it plays well with in, into, that, um, into that narrative about our country, unfortunately. And it, um, speaking of sidestepping things, it, it sidesteps a larger conversation about how, um, how globally networked we are and how, um, if you're talking about business models, how global capitalism works. Um, it's very nice that, um, you know, you could say, for example, um, the, the folks that, um, uh, you know, primarily who are leasing in, in my part of Ohio, Belmont County, is Gulfport Energy out of Oklahoma. But Gulfport has international holdings and international markets. You know, they're in the Canadian um, uh, sand, uh, sand plays. They're in Thailand and new shale plays, plays there as well. So this notion that we're somehow working with just American companies to just protect American interests is really short-sighted and, and sidesteps a lot of, 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 of reality, um, frankly. But it's, it's also not new. Um, you know, you can go back to a uh, Democratic presidency, the famous crisis of confidence speech by Jimmy Carter in the late 70s, where he you know, basically banged on the desk and said, you know, we will never from this day forward use another drop of foreign oil. We will rely on our own resources to be a um, self-sustained nation. And one of the things that he mentioned back in the 70s was shale energy, even as it was just developing as a, as a technology. Um, so this notion of uh, this protectionist notion isn't isn't new, but it's it's trotted out with a greater frequency these days, and it's easy. It's an easy thing to rally behind without sort of pulling back the covers on and 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 looking at. Great. I want to circle back to something, Pete. You mentioned Trump and politics, and start. We started to go Sorry down that road, that. so I just want to continue <laughs> down that road. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the rhetorical strategies that politicians use um, to talk about energy and the environment and the effectiveness of that. So um, Trump won his largest percentage of votes from two high coal producing states, um, West Virginia and Wyoming, by promising to bring back coal jobs. Um, so how can politicians connect with coal field communities if they can't promise to bring back coal jobs? I'm looking at you. <laughs> okay. I did write that question. <laughs> so, so you have to answer. Um, it's on you now. <laughs> I, um, I, I was thinking about this almost in terms of what Emily was saying earlier about being in a, present in a community and uh, getting to know the people, getting to know the problems they're facing. And in some ways, I feel like... Um, uh, there, there's been too much kind of uh, um, assumption of why people in coal-producing states voted for Trump, and I think there's a whole spectrum of reasons. But one of those might have to do with the fact that uh, people felt like he was making an effort to understand the problems that they're facing. And... Um, there, there was a speech in the state legislature about flyover country that some people might remember. And I think that Trump, whether genuine or not, was able to convince people that he um, cared about what was happening in flyover country. Yeah. And so I think that one of the strategies has to be for um, people running for office to genuinely go and listen to people spend time in communities in so-called red states 
and be able to put forward ideas that actually resonate with them and um, address some of the issues in their lives without being, um, without living in a fantasy world either. And right now I believe the Democrats are trying to figure out what that looks like and I'm not uh, entirely impressed at this point yet. But it's early, there's a, there's a lot of time, but um, uh, I, whoever it is, I don't care if they're a Democrat, Republican or other, it would be good for them to come and spend a lot of time in a place like Southern West Virginia and start to grapple with those problems. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't think that it was a situation where if you don't tell us you're bringing back coal jobs, we don't want anything to do with you. You know, I don't think it's that or the highway. I think it's just they want economic prosperity. Um, these, you know, especially in southern West Virginia, I mean, uh, these counties are struggling and the opioid epidemic has not helped the matter at all. Um, so I think it's, it's about connecting with the communities, like you said, and, um, and just giving them hope you know, in, in a brighter future that their economy can recover um, from um, the downturn, you know, in, in coal because they have relied so heavily on it. So I, I don't think it has to be a promise of coal jobs. I think jobs, <laughs> you know, would be a good start. I, I know in, um, during the election season, at least leading up to um, 2016, there was still um, actively um, campaigning against, in, in my area of Belmont County at least, um, against um, some of Obama's policies. So you could go down the road and see big billboards that said, Obama's no job zone. And there would be a map of Ohio and Pennsylvania and West Virginia, and it was blacked out. Um, and it was sponsored by um, coal and oil and gas companies. So on the flip side of that, the rhetorical strategies of that marketing to say that this is definitively a no-job place based on the policies of that organization were pretty effective in in my region at least. Right. So in our book we call the this strategy of the no-job zone and uh, what the coal industry called the war on coal, the industrial apocalyptic. So environmentalists are often accused of being apocalyptic in their claims about uh, what are the consequences of not acting to protect the environment? And um, it's been very effective to label that as apocalyptic and sort of absurd uh, when a job is at stake, for example. Um, but one of the things that goes into that kind of rhetoric is that it's more than just about a job, right? It's, it's about the destruction of an entire way of life. It's about um, uh, destruction of... Uh, an important set of values. Um, so, uh, and there's absurd characterizations there, right? Uh, linkages to terrorism. Uh, in Colorado, or, you know, it was, you know, during the Obama administration in 2014 when they were putting out their uh, proposals to regulate uh, uh, coal-fired power plants, um, uh, there was an ad run it said, you know, what would you call an organization that was going to uh, eliminate 25% of our electric grid, right? Terrorist, anarchist, you know, Obama's EPA. You know, it, it goes over the top in that regard, right? Um, and I, I think it's important that we recognize that, right? That it's, it's more than just rhetoric about a job. It's also rhetoric about values. It's a very often backward-looking rhetoric. Um, as opposed to a forward-looking rhetoric. Uh, recently in Michigan, uh, there was a proposal for an uh, environmental performance standard for electricity generation. And the sponsors of that referendum uh, focused on uh, health problems, they focused on lower medical costs from reduced pollution, and they focused on more jobs that pay well from producing uh, renewable types of energy. And it didn't even need to go to referendum. The electric company eventually came with the utility and said, we'll, we'll do 25% instead of 30% if we don't vote on this. And they said, okay, right? So we know what some of that rhetoric is and it needs to be a positive vision, right? Giving people a positive vision of what's in it for them. The coal industry, Trump now, uh, what they have is a negative vision, right? And it's a negative vision what you're gonna lose 
and it's backward looking. And ultimately, once we move into this policy realm and this policy debate about what's going to happen, you know, both Senator Byrd and Senator Rockefeller, when they were very much at the end of their careers, said, we can keep using scapegoating and we can keep using scaremongering, but that's going to leave West Virginia behind. And it's kind of like, where do you want to be in this, right? Uh, and at some point, a positive vision needs to, needs to be brought forward. And, and places like West Virginia need to figure out where they're going to fit and uh, what they want out of all this. Do they want some of what the new Green New Deal has to offer? Do, you know, what happens if there's a tax on carbon? And what happens if there's not dividends that are brought back here? And they could get run over. And that's where it becomes really important for some leadership. Rockefeller was very harsh when he said there's been no leadership from the coal industry on this. So. Great. All right, I want to turn the conversation to talk a little bit about um, oil and gas. So um, a lot of the oil and gas boom in Appalachia has been created uh, because people have sold or leased acreage to energy companies to make fracking a viable um, situation. So how do we communicate with individual landowners so that they understand how they intertwine with complex networks of local, regional, and global capital and their consequences? I might have written that question. <laughs> <laughs> you did write that question. Well, hoping for the wisdom of my new, new colleagues here. Um, I'll, I'll just say a, um, a couple of things um, about the context of, of, of Belmont County and Southeast Ohio. Um, so many of my neighbors are, you know, they own three acres. They own five acres. Um, small parcels of land, but we're also... Um, you know, it feels like we're miles apart. So you're like me, you're an absentee landowner, um, or you're um, perhaps somebody who um, uh, inherited some land and it's just kind of hanging out there. Um, perhaps it's, 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 it's a small parcel left over that's owned by a, a coal company, for example, um, a timber company. Maybe it's a, a group of people who got together and purchased 100 acres as a... Um, as a recreational piece of property for um, hunting and fishing, that sort of thing. So it's a really diverse group um, and, and disparate group in terms of our um, ability to, to, to readily connect. Um, so um, in the piece that I, um, that I prepared, uh, or the forthcoming article rather, talk about the importance of local landowner groups and associations that bring people together that might not otherwise even know each other. I mean, I don't know my, really know my neighbors um, very well in this, in this part of the, um, in, in this part of, uh, I guess you could call the foothills of, of, of the Appalachians. Um, and it's been invaluable to have become a member of this of this association because you effectively enter into a um, collective bargaining group that provides you with some some power over um, over large oil and gas companies that you might not otherwise ever have as somebody who owns three, five, ten, forty acres of land, especially when you think about a drilling unit that, if it comes to be, will be somewhere in the area of seven hundred acres. If you command that kind of acreage, then you have some real authority. But most of us, most of us don't. Most of us can't afford a legal team to review leases and go to bat for us on behalf of, 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 of you know, again, somebody owns three to five acres. Um, so when I went to my first association meeting, I, I pulled into the little fire hall where they were, we were getting us, um, getting us together. And there was, a, a, I parked my truck next to a horse and buggy, like honestly a horse and buggy. Um, and, and it was just really such an eclectic group of people, but we were all there just trying to get answers, trying to understand, because we, again, couldn't afford a, um, a legal team to understand what, what it was that we m might be embarking on. So that, that l at the local level, the landowner organization, if you can get that kind of leadership off the ground is, is really, really important. So it's people sharing emails, starting Facebook groups, um, just phone calls to, to you, know, you know, reaching out because you can look up in public records who owns, um, who owns different parcels of land. So just being proactive about just getting to know your neighbors and, and what they may or may not be um, agreeing to do. Uh, I know in Pennsylvania there are um, a number of, 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 
of landowners who have who have shared with me anecdotally that they just felt um, uh, just pressure to to cave into the um, uh, to, to to signing and joining in because they just felt the presence the looming presence of the of the um, of the oil and gas boom and and they heard through somebody who heard through somebody that their neighbor had leased and they didn't want to um, you know be left out of the out of the process but all the while not knowing what they were what they were agreeing to so this is a um, it's a communication issue to to be sure. I'll add that I, I was telling Brian that my father owns a couple hundred acres in Belmont County, Ohio, uh, that he bought, he and his, his buddy bought to hunt on. And the biggest challenge for them has been getting any information at all out of the companies once they sign the lease. And um, they have uh, the company and their contractors and their subcontractors coming and going regularly, but uh, little understanding of what's happening um, I we found on a website that they were producing gas for a year or more before they had ever gotten a royalty check or heard about a royalty check and so I think there are some real issues with transparency that probably need to be addressed um, certainly in the contracts but maybe even by law uh, they are required to report on production, but um, they're not required to communicate with land landowners about what they're doing. So I think that's a big problem. Well, and I think news media can play a role here, too. You know, in a situation like that, um, they, they could hopefully go to a local media outlet and, you know, and, and pitch this as, hey, we're going through this issue. Um, I'll refer back to Ken Ward's reporting with the um, ProPublica. His reporting in November was on some of these very issues, um, where I think it's EQT is um, trying to file a lawsuit to change um, a, um, a statute in West Virginia that deals with royalties and the amount um, of money that people make off of the gas produced. Um, and, you know, I mean, that case could have been, you know, quietly filed and no one might have really noticed. But um, I, I tend to think that because he's dedicating all of his time now to covering this industry that he's on top of those sorts of things as well. Um, and so that reporting, you know, focused on um, individual landowners who are not getting um, what they, they say they should be getting in terms of royalties. So I think the news media um, can play a role in this as well. And I remember when I um, was still at West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I had a reporter in the Northern Panhandle who um, did a story on the new millionaires of Marshall County, I think it was, in, in Marshall County. These people were signing leases and, and making literally millions. And um, I think exposing that to uh, lets the community know what deals are being made. And I think that's important to, to kind of make that public information so that people can um, uh, be well educated if, if it comes time for them to make a decision about their own property. Just to be clear, if you have 16 acres in production, you're not a millionaire. Just, yeah. so, just so you know. I don't know. I don't, know what, I, I don't remember the particulars about this story. but I mean, they may be. I'm just yeah. saying. Yeah. I can vouch for that. My family owns 20, and we are not millionaires. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would just add, um, there was, and it was just sort of, it's related to this, right? And um, there's not a lot of, public infrastructure law and so forth around all these issues. And when fracking became an issue, we're right on the edge of the Marcellus shell, shell, Marcellus shell where I live. When it became a big issue, people in our community were very concerned, right? And one of the things that they did is they brought people in from Pennsylvania and from West Virginia to learn about it, right? And one of the things that uh, 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 he was a, I think a volunteer firefighter from uh, somewhere up in West Virginia here, and he he brought us a video of the traffic that started to happen in their community, right? Mm -hmm. And what it was doing to their ability as volunteer firemen to do their job or firefighters, and. 
um, that was really influential on in our community of just kind of looking and saying like, we don't have the infrastructure to deal with this, right? Um, but if it wasn't for some people who got together and started to have those conversations and invite those people to come and talk to people, uh, decision makers in our community, things would have been a lot different. Um, rules about, you know, laws about all kinds of things, including what kinds of infrastructure, at least with the coal industry, there's been severance tax and those sorts of things that become really important. Um, Maybe they're not always as high as uh, they don't really pay for themselves in a lot of cases and so on. But these are all things that you know need to be looked at. It's part of the bigger bigger piece of the puzzle. Yeah, I remember that was the t severance tax was an issue when we were first reporting about the gas boom. Um, you know, about ten plus years ago, that was one of the things we did a story on. Was okay, let's look at what other states are getting. You know, and every, you know, as West Virginia is about to potentially have this windfall. Well, and it's a two-edged sword because counties become dependent on that severance tax for uh, schools and roads. Mm -hmm. And when the severance tax dropped about four years ago, uh, counties like Mingo County found themselves in a terrible bind for how to keep their schools open. And they came up with some solutions that not everybody agrees with. And uh, uh, will not likely lead to a stronger educational system in Mingo County. So I think that that's the other thing is that when the severance tax, which by the way was first proposed in 1954 by Governor William Marlin, who as people know was driving a cab in Chicago within six years after proposing that severance tax. And there was a lot of industrial apocalyptic rhetoric at the time that uh, the severance tax would destroy the industry and so forth. But um, yeah, it, um, I, I think that the other thing about environment versus jobs is that it ignores these costs that Pete's talking about, that the industry shifts onto the public uh, to maintain the infrastructure that the industry is um, using. Absolutely. I'll just just add add to that as well. That I mean, in our area, um, you know, it used to be uh, gravel roads. Maybe they were one and a half car wide. You know, it's the sort of thing where another truck was coming down, and one of you had to kind of agree <laughs> who who was going to pull off to the side so the other could get by, kind of thing. But now you've got major you know, truck traffic coming through pretty much every day to multiple well pad sites. So They've come in and um, paved roads that, I, I, when it first happened, it was it was you know astonishing. I, I've been going to this area for 15 years, and all of a sudden, s large sections of it showed up paved. Now you can almost see the boom bust cycle uh, about to happen because they're doing the minimum that they need to do. They're putting down like two inches of asphalt, which barely holds up to these huge, huge trucks, and then part of it will slip and fall away and then they'll do a little bit of repair and then it'll fall away again and you can tell they're just barely keeping up with what the minimum standards they need to do in order to get the permits to run the trucks that they need to run on these roads and you can just get a sense that when when it's time to go away they will step away and we'll have the slips and the cracks and the, and the rest to contend with so it's it, it is a double-edged sword all right so I want to pull back a little bit and and think on broader, I, I guess a little bit more broad terms, um, what types of communication or rhetoric prevent productive dialogue about the future of energy and the environment? I guess I wrote that question. <laughs> I'm actually not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like something I would write. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think we've talked about a couple of them. So one is... Um, The jobs versus environment frame is oversimplified and compounded or amplified by an, in a sort of an apocalyptic quality. Um, I think one of the other ones that we talk about in our book is is the problem of what we call corporate ventriloquism. Mm -hmm. uh, people talk about front groups or astroturf and who is this organization and and so on and 
one of the things that we started looking at is how many uh, uh, just sort of uh, Russian doll nested organizations mm -hmm. there are and how uh, often it is almost impossible to figure out who is the funder of that organization, right? And now a lot of times, you know, you or I could go on and sign up, and, you know, like I agree with these ideas and you can become kind of a like signer honor or a member or uh, something to that effect. But, you know, in public deliberation, one important factor is knowing something about the person or the organization that's making the argument, right? What's their ethos? Like, do we trust them? Um, and what might their motives be? And when you start doing that kind of stuff, uh, it makes it uh, hard to have a good public dialogue, a good discussion. Um, and another thing they'll do is, uh, a lot of times, uh, the more they're going after the, the, the big attack, the attack dog, so to speak, um, the more that gets sort of really Russian dolled so that there's a lot of plausible deniability as to who and whatever funded that organization. And they use the classic strategy. So out in Colorado on the fracking debates, when the Sierra Club and Food and Water Watch and the Environmental Defense Fund showed up to help people who weren't sure if they wanted fracking in their areas, um, the attacks came that they uh, were special interest groups, that they had ulterior motives, um, and uh, 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 all of these sorts of things, right? So basically, like, and you, and you kind of step back and it's like, well, who's making this claim, right? The claim is being made by a very large multinational corporation who has nothing but profit in mind, and they're accusing these people of having uh, impure motives, right? Because they're not from Colorado. Well, technically, I guess the Sierra Club is, uh, at the time, was based in San Francisco, but they did have members in Colorado, and they did have local chapters in Colorado, and yet uh, these TV ads go out. Now, I don't know that people are always, like, super fooled by these kinds of TV uh, advertisements, right? But one of the things I think it does do, it's, it's sort of that propaganda effect, right? The point of propaganda is to get you to question whether or not you really know what you know. And in some ways, what they're doing is just throwing so much crap out there uh, that everyone starts to question, is there anybody that has a real pure motive here? Or is anybody not biased here? Or something to that effect. And uh, I think in that regard, it's it's pretty effective, right? So I think that's definitely uh, another one that is really a problem. Oh, Ed. Um, so I think this is what Pete's talking about. Also fits into an us versus them kind of uh, mentality. That um, when so the article that me and um, my colleague just finished looked at six years of the magazine Coal Age, and we looked for every time they mentioned environmentalist or activist, and then we looked at those 87 articles and how those terms were framed within those articles. And uh, only in two instances did it have a positive frame, and in both cases it was the coal industry that was the real <laughs> environmentalist, something that uh, Bill Rainey president of the West Virginia Coal Association likes to say. But um, there were the more obvious tactics used to sort of turn people against the environmental reformers by presenting them as um, uh, self-motivated or political or deceitful or a whole series of things. There were also more subtle ways that they created the them in this situation. And one of the ways was almost always presenting the environmentalist or activist as the object of a sentence, almost ne never as the subject of the sentence. And so that meant that the industry almost always had the verbs. And, uh, and then we sampled the verbs that were used for both uh, and the most common for the industry were go, add, complete, produce, ship, expand, enable, um, almost all creating or 
positive verbs. The ones for the environmentalists were claim, oppose, say, and sue. And um, <laughs> so it gives you, an, and the other thing was that the industry almost always was a named organization and a named individual spokesperson, whereas the environmentalists were almost always presented as sort of a nameless, faceless other. Only two times were they, was an organization named and that was, um, one was the Sierra Club, and they, certainly they have already been uh, framed many, many times over. And so it, it leads you to question, well, if you're a coal company executive and you have a steady diet of this uh, kind of uh, rhetoric or this kind of information that you're consuming on a regular basis, what do you then begin to think about the um, environmentalist or the, the activist? And it, I think that you, you've seen a lot of tensions in the coal fields um, and a lot of threats and uh, intimidation and acts of vandalism and other things, partly because of this kind of rhetoric that amps up the situation and uh, escalates things. Um, so obviously that is not productive. The trope of uncertainty is a really powerful thing. Right? And in any time that you can endure, uncertainty serves um, a couple of, of in a couple of powerful ways for um, the oil and gas industry. One is to um, to say that, well, you know, we're not really quite sure yet um, about this data on the hazards of fracking and say water pollution or water contamination. Um, we know that sometimes a wellhead will leak, but really that's kind of an anomaly, that's sort of an outlier um, statistically. So more research needs to be done. So you introduce that, well, maybe, but we've got more work to do. From the time being, we'll just, we'll just keep going on down this road until we, until we, uh, until we get it together in terms of, 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 of research and moving towards that, that certainty. When, of course, the goal is not to achieve some sort of clarity on the realities of climate change and global warming, which the scientific community would like to stand up and say, yes, yes, we're, we're actually quite unified on this, this messaging. Thank you very much. Um, and, and I think, thankfully, that that, um, that message is um, um, getting louder and, and, a, and a bit more clear some of the statistics that you were citing um, in terms of, of, of the number of, of, of voters who are um, recognizing the realities, um, the realities around them. Uh, so um, uncertainty as a, as a trope is, is a very powerful thing in this, in this arena. I'll just add, you saying uncertainty reminds me too that they use um, strategic ambiguity really well too, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, clean coal. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, well, you know, we had it in the 1920s when we washed it, so it wasn't dusty. Mm -hmm. And then we had it in the 1970s when w the uh, legislators forced uh, uh, scrubbers to reduce acid rain and reduce other kinds of, of pollutants. Um, but do we have it for carbon capture and sequestration yet? Well, the advertisements run all through the 20, 2008 uh, campaign season and again in, uh, throughout 2012. Uh, would lead you to believe that, yeah, we've got it, right? Uh, but we don't have it yet. And uh, the coal industry in memos between trade organizations was very clear, right? Like, we know we have to be in favor of something, mm -hmm. right? So the something we're going to be in favor of is carbon capture and sequestration. We'll call it clean coal, right? And uh, it's used purely for PR, right? Uh, because there's never any point at which they were really adamant about going and saying, look, we want to develop this, we need your help, and, and pushing forward some sort of large policy in which that would be included in. Um, and uh, yeah, so you know, it, it, it's the sort of flip side of uncertainty is this kind of strategic ambiguity. Um, uh, their bluff got called in a way, right, in the Obama administration, and then all these people said that clean coal is great, and I was like, wait, we don't have it. Right? We can't have this regulation on coal fire power plants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, I have a question that's a two-part question, one that you're prepared for and one that I've been thinking about myself. Um, right. <laughs> 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 so um, we've talked about 
forms of communication that aren't exactly um, helpful. So can you tell me what types of communication might facilitate uh, more productive conversations about energy and the environment? And um, I kind of my question to you is, how can individuals or those the small groups that some of you have mentioned, um, small groups of people who are interested in acting as change agents, how can they feel empowered or or get their voices heard when there's such small groups of change agents in larger, easily drawn out by corporations? One thing uh, I've been thinking about is that um, uh, we, we talk about propaganda and um, the us versus them and the industrial apocalyptic and all of these frameworks and I've been thinking that um, somehow we need to, as a people, develop the critical thinking skills that help us break through some of these things. And another one that, that I was thinking about is the, the news story that uh, I might click on on Facebook that might make me feel superior or uh, righteous in some way and give me sort of a jolt and yes that's right you know and <laughs> kind of so I think that oftentimes when we're clicking on these things and it, this is not Ken Ward's stories certainly I think Ken Ward has a mission to educate and to try to shed some light on very complicated issues I, I just keep thinking somehow we've got to be working to to also educate people on this kind of emotional uh, payoff that we get from the the kinds of rhetoric that are not helpful. So I'm I'm still working on that solution, though. I'm not sure where to go with it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it can be sometimes too a case of cognitive dissonance where. Um, uh, you can use climate change too as an example. It's you know gloom and doom. It's too much. I can't take it. I'm just gonna you know pretend it doesn't exist, and move along. You know, and and it's more comfortable if I can deny it. And um, so I think um, we do have to be more critical consumers ourselves of information and of news media um, content. And and I think uh, from a, a journalistic perspective. Um, there is a term now, um, solutions journalism, uh, where the focus is on um, solutions in the issues that you're covering. And actually the response uh, to this and climate change coverage has been positive. People would rather read a story about how a community is um, preparing or trying to be resilient in the face of climate change than they would about um, the uh, the warming that's going on and you know the devastating things that are happening um, so I think that um, that could be a method for uh, more productive communication on some of these issues yeah. Yeah. go ahead ready yeah, I mean, just more education in terms of how we are implicated in larger global networks, um, you know, at the local level and, and, and spread out from there. Um, you know, it's the, the metaphor of hitting the, the light switch and the lights coming on and all the power and all of our devices in this room, where, all, where does all of that come from? The big oil and gas companies and the um, coal companies are invested in their current business models, um, as was discussed earlier. There's there's very little payoff for them getting into um, renewables uh, in the way that, um, you know, after you set up your solar panels and get the network in place, the sun comes out, you, they don't necessarily get to send you a monthly bill for the, your, your use of, of, of non-renewable resources. Their business model is based on um, ex the extractive industry and non-renewable resources. So they're not in it. Um, for um, for renewables in the same way that some of these other smaller organizations, a Sierra chapter, for example, in Colorado, might be to push that kind of educational message forward. So I think we just need to start listening to those those local and regional messages to get to get that across to unpack some of the um, to, to unpack some of the structures that are behind our current practices, which is to say, 
large corporate profits for antiquated business models. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, Lou is talking about, uh, I think you talked about it here, the museum. Right? Mm -hmm. no, that wasn't just out beforehand. Good. Um, but the West I, Virginia Mine Wars Museum, wvminewars.com. <laughs> Perfect. Well, Mate uh, one. Projects like that, right? I mean, mm -hmm. they, they're uh, really great projects at the, at the, at the local level, right? Um, where you are able to find some amount of common ground, right? Um, and I think focusing on things like history in a local community uh, are really important. And, uh, you know, I, I think you were saying earlier, too, that, you know, to outsiders, very much like the woman telling you, leave, right, we're done with you, you know. But, um, but that's not necessarily what they have to say to each other all the time uh, about knowing what the history of the place is and the history of the industry and the history uh, of how uh, things have evolved. Um, so that's, I think, a really important thing to be happening at the local level. I also think um, focusing on solutions, right, policies, we, like like Matthew Nisbet says, we're now on to the sort of policy phase of the climate change debate. And those policies, you know, the, there are proposals coming from the right and from the left. I guess I should say from the left and from the right because it fits the story better. <laughs> um, but there are lots of varieties of policies on big scales and small scales now. And I think focusing on that debate and focusing on what the benefits and the problems with each of those different sorts of policies are, right? So um, that's a productive way to go about having the conversation. What, what kind of, of policies do we want that are going to uh, reshape some of the, the, the energy system that we have? And, and if there are places that are going to not come out ahead from those policies, what other policies need to be adopted to, to address those issues, right? And I think that's exactly what Rockefeller and, and, and Byrd were saying, right? Like if we're not in those conversations, we will be left behind. And, um, and so I think, you know, focusing on that finding, and like you said, the Democrats kind of in disarray, but uh, having some kind of vision, you know, um, and it's, think about it, right, there's a, a, a presidential candidate, Inslee, right, who is thoroughly focused on climate change. That is his campaign, right, and whether or not he gets the nomination, he's at least saying my goal is to get this issue into the national conversation. Um, so I think it's going to happen, and I think by focusing on policies, focusing on solutions at the local and at the national level, it, it will begin to change the conversation. And Lakeisha, can I say I'm thinking about, um, you know, you're from southwest Virginia, mm -hmm. small town, rural area. Mm -hmm. And um, the West Virginia Mine Wars Museum has been a great magnet for national journalists to come to Mingo County and to find somebody to interview. And um, uh, recently, Wyatt Sinek, I don't know if people know Wyatt Sinek, he was on The Daily Show. He came to the Mine Wars Museum to interview Terry Steele, a retired miner, and his wife, Wilma Steele, a retired school teacher. And um, me and my wife sat down to watch the episode. His show's called Problem Areas. And, you know, I started watching it, and, I, and it's always like, Ooh, what's yeah. this gonna, what's he gonna do? <laughs> There's a little bit of anxiety. And um, it turned out, um, I'm not in his demographic for the humor, I don't think, but um, I thought he did a really good job of covering the teachers' strike and the, the working conditions of the teachers. The interviews with Terry and Wilma got cut out. Unfortunately, I keep hoping that maybe they'll be in a later episode this season. But there's this imbalance of power when it comes to um, people in these areas being able to tell their story, even when they have a national audience in front of them, because you never know how it's going to turn out in the editing and so on. And I would actually be interested in hearing your thoughts on what uh, groups in these areas might be able to do to make their voices heard? 
Oh, what do I think they could do? I think that's a big question. Um, See, when you I, write the question. Yeah, it's a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's something I've thought about for a long time because I grew up watching it and I grew up, you know, having my dad have two different opinions about, well, we vote for this person because this person supports coal, but we don't really like what that person does. So then when I was little, I would always say, okay, then who do we vote for? So when I started voting, I was very confused about how that process actually worked. <laughs> um, and I knew that there were people who, you know, lived on, who lived near mines and they were concerned about their drinking water because they had well water or whatever. So I was, I was hearing those conversations all, all the time. And people would come from, you know, two hours away, two, three hours away would be where our biggest news station was that was close by. So they did come down and they did have conversations about what was going on with the water and, you know, if, if it was being impacted by the runoff from the mines. And, and a lot of it did not ever see the light of day. And one of the reasons that one of the people they interviewed, they were told it's because nobody can understand what you say. Nobody understands your accent. And my thought was, we all live in the same area. Like, <laughs> I'm sure they understand what you're saying. And so I'm not, while I wasn't sure at the time why that wasn't making the news as it should, I'm confident now it has something to do with corporations controlling that media. And so um, I'm not exactly sure what I think that they can do about that because I've not found a way that I think people, especially where I'm from in Southwest Virginia, have a voice at all. Um, if anything, you know, we we flood frequently where I'm from, and and the um, Corps of Engineers has literally said to the mayor of the town, it's not a priority if the town floods and it goes away. So when you're being told you you don't even matter, it's really hard to feel empowered to speak up. And um, they have gone to legislative, you know events and and they pay all the miners to lobby and so you know they've done a really good job of keeping the miners under their thumbs and they're not willing to kind of break that mold so i'm not i'm not sure about in these small communities how to, how to address that other than education and having you know we have a coal field museum where i'm from but nobody visits and so you know getting it, and some of that's having the money to do the publicity to get the people to come and then some of it's access issues. You, you, don't, you can't drive two hours to a museum because you might not have the ability to, to do that. You either don't have transportation or it's too far of a drive. And so making it more accessible, making that information more accessible and, and doing more education so that they feel like they're being heard and they have a place to talk. All right, so on that note, I think we have to wrap it up for right now, but we're going to open it up to Q&A. So if anybody has a question, I'm sure that we would love to hear it. So just raise your hand and let us know if you have one. Don't everybody go at once. <laughs> no, no questions? Okay, go ahead. <coughs> It's kind of a question for everyone who's talking about the tone of information. And I feel, well, I guess it's a question. Is there not enough focus on winning in these conversations? But the end game, really. What does the end game look like in this? Is if, we, um, if the need to address global climate change is to stop burning fossil fuels, how will this end game play out? You know, I think people are mature enough to think for 20, 30, 40 years. And what does this change and transition look like? There's a lot of complex questions. Like, um, I think in part there's been a, it just seems like a feel that there's been such a big fracking boom because of the Trump presidency. Last 2016, 2017 have been, 2018, been enormous energy production years in the United States. And I feel like it's, people are kind of trying to stake the claim, you know, put the resources in the ground, but 
yeah, how is this going to play out over time? And how do we keep the conversation on winning the future? You know? That's kind of jumbled up. There's a, there's a, <laughs> I just, there's actually two questions. Like 20, 2016 through 2019 have seemed like a, a spasm, a paroxysm of energy development in the United States. And it's, it's scary. Um, but also, and maybe it's the anomalous presidency of Trump that's, you know, is not in, synch in synchrony with even conservative policy recommendations, really. But also the other side of that is the next 20 years, how does winning the tone and rhetoric and vision of the future One th thought that just comes to mind um, is uh, that uh, I, I talked earlier about how um, if we just click on the news stories that make us feel good or get us charged up or whatever, um, that that fuels this us versus them rhetoric. In other words, those of us who click on those things have played a role. And um, we sometimes unfairly uh, might uh, blame the enemy of the people, uh, our, <laughs> our friends in journalism, when in fact the consumers of this information have a role. Similarly, um, when we place all the focus on the um, the energy companies and uh, what they're doing, it allows us to kind of forget about the role that we play as energy consumers. I think that um, uh, energy consumption has also been increasing steadily and we haven't been always willing to think about what a future with curtailed energy usage, usage looks like. And, and I think that uh, it's, certainly something that we need to be talking more about, I think. Right here at the university, there's a huge effort uh, to do a lot of development in the shale gas industry. So we here at the university, students, staff, faculty, I mean, we, we can have a voice in that. How do we do it and how do we approach the right people? So, you know, it's not an issue that's out there. It can happen. We can address it right here at our university. Yeah, and I'd just say, you know, we were trying to do that in our project last uh, year where we covered the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. There's not a lot of news coverage about that in West Virginia. It was mostly in, in um, southwestern Virginia is where the media coverage on that um, was coming out. And so we saw that as an opportunity to um, provide more information around what was happening here in West Virginia. So I think um, in that way, the university did play a role. And, and helping to um, just illuminate the issue. You know, it was, it was almost like people didn't even know it was going on. Mm -hmm. You know, what are all those pipes for, uh, you know, over at the industrial park? Right. Um, and, you know, so we built a whole project around just digging into that and exploring what that's all about. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to forget the, um, the URL, but it's, it's mseal, M-S-E-A-L, mseal.org. So you can log on and, and see the, um, the, you know, the, the production rates out of the, out of the wells that WVU and Ohio State in conjunction with some oil and gas companies have, have drilled and fracked. Um, what was the website? Somebody asked about the website. Um, M-C, is it S-E-A-L? Yeah, M-S-E-E-L. They're, they're doing test fracking wells over across the river yeah. to figure out these technologies that can really advance the industry and look at uh, damage to the environment and other things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I forget what the acronym yeah, stands I mean, for, yeah. but M S E E L. Yeah. 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 Um, wow. Okay. So. Uh, first thing uh, comes to mind is. Uh, there's a case out in Wyoming, right, where um, an artist put an art exhibit uh, at the University of Wyoming, and it was uh, trees that had burned uh, from the pine bark beetle uh, after pine bark beetle infestation, which is associated with climate change, according to ecologists, right? And 
he put this big exhibit, and I can't remember the name of it um, uh, right now. And uh, the University of Wyoming gets lots of money from the oil and gas industry. Uh, and so they were offended. Mm -hmm. And there was a whole controversy about whether art and free speech on a college campus, a university, should, should happen. And um, uh, they ultimately sort of quietly the thing went away and somebody said, well, it's because we can't maintain it or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the, there was the criticism that came from the industry was, was sharp, right? And quotes like, you know, like, I feel like I've been stabbed in the back, you know, and, uh, and hurt feelings and then sort of attacking and, you know, we're as much in favor of free speech and academic freedom as anybody else, but this really hurts, right? Because we donate so much to University of Wyoming. And it, it sort of raises these questions about the relationship between public universities uh, and uh, large multinational corporations um, that don't have or do have at least something to do with why teachers are on strike in West Virginia and Oklahoma and places like this, right? And I think, you know, we really need to start thinking about uh, these things, right? The uh, second or first part of the question, which was about winning, I guess, um, and, you know, I agree with uh, uh, what Lou had to say, but, you know, I, I guess in some ways I, I don't know that there's ever, like, a moment when it, it's over, mm -hmm. right? We won, right? Um, but I do think that that's the right question in some ways, right? Like, what is going to happen, right? Like, what kind of policy, you know, putting big policies together of this magnitude are not simple things that just sort of happen, right? There's a lot of negotiation that has to happen and a lot of thought has to go into it. Uh, take something as sort of uncontroversial, but was as, was controversial today, the Wilderness Act, right? What It was rewritten like and reintroduced, I, I believe like 10 years in a row before it finally became law, right? Um, so that's the question, right? Like what is it gonna look like? And I think that's the conversation that I was saying we need to be involved in, right? What do we want it to look like? What values do we want to, to be uh, important, right? What does a just transition look like for uh, uh, people who maybe can't afford uh, energy if the price goes up because we put taxes on it and so on and so forth, right? And all of those are the questions that we need to be grappling with now and, and engaging at every level. Uh, I think that's that's just crucial. May I say something else? Sure. <laughs> so the the idea of being able to contribute to policy development. I at first of all, I thought your all your presentations were excellent. Thank you. Um, but working on policy development can seem kind of inaccessible. But there's something going on right now in West Virginia. Uh, a progressive candidate named Stephen Smith is running for governor, and he is starting, almost two years out, developing a grassroots movement of people in every county in West Virginia to do just this. And we just started here in Mon County, get together, talk about what we want to see our county uh, look like as we move forward, and work on policies. So th this is a really very exciting thing happening right now in West Virginia. So that's one concrete way we have now to work on policy. And it, it can be any kind of policy, not just environmental, you know, poverty, health, food, whatever. I'll also say that Stephen Smith uh, held a kickoff uh, event in Mate One talking about the Mine Wars and the Mine Wars Museum. So I don't want to say that I'm responsible for his candidacy, <laughs> but I, I think, you know, had something to do with it. But I think he's trying to, you know, put, put into practice what, what you're talking about. Go to those communities, hear what they have to say, find out what they need, and help them have, make their voice part of the process. I'm going to go back to your question about winning because I'm not sure we ever win it either. I think it's a conversation that's continually ongoing. But one of the things that I think we have to do is reduce confusion. And I think there are a lot of people in small communities are 
they're confused. For instance, they don't understand how climate change can impact a beetle. You know, that doesn't make sense to, to people. And that's, that's for a variety of reasons, the not understanding difficult, complex science terminology or, you know, not having higher education um, and simply not being exposed to that information over time. So I think that we have to th think about where people are, what they understand as far as being literate about communication and about science and about the environment and meet those people where they are instead of talking over them where they, they don't understand how climate change impacts a beetle. Um, and then I also think we really have to think about the ways that we're going to invest in workforce in small communities. Um, a lot of people are driven to defend coal communities because it's where they see their job. And we know that rhetoric seems to change when there are other opportunities. So I think that investing in those small communities in different ways and giving them alternative options can help us change that conversation over time. Well, I'd like to add that um, um, I was I had a conversation with an author, Tricia Shapiro, who wrote about the environmental movement to end mountaintop removal. And I was asking her, well, how does it end? Um, what does victory look like? And she said that um, we're, we're not just trying to end something that started 10 or 15 years ago. We're trying to change a culture that's existed for about two or three centuries mm -hmm. now. And it's a culture of maximizing productivity and production, max, maximizing consumption, and sort of a use it up and move on culture that uh, is pervasive. And so it, 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 we definitely need good policy. We definitely need to address these things through our legislatures. But we also need to think about this culture that is driving a lot of the things that we do, mm -hmm. which is another one of those, how do I wrap my mind around this mm -hmm. thing yeah. kind of question. Are there any other questions? Um, I was just wondering um, if, you, if there are any ongoing research efforts in um, this field and environment on any of the issues that you're talking about, uh, or if there are lots, if there are any that you think are particularly important. Um, I'm, I guess I'm a, a, I have a, a master's in public health and um, was interested in going into, first into um, like social and behavioral change communication, but I'm wondering if there might be some way to get into the field of, uh, uh, social change communication, something like that, doing like a mass marketing campaign or, but I really don't know anything about the field. So I was just wondering if you guys had any uh, suggestions or anything to say. Yeah. I think Emily might be able to talk a little bit oh, about gosh, journalism. I I'm the least yeah. qualified person to talk about that. Um, you know, um, we, d we have some kind of hands-on, really tangible projects going on. Um, one that comes to mind with what you're talking about is um, Brand Journey. Um, and it's uh, led by Dr. Rita Kalistra at my college. And she goes into these communities with a class of students, and they um, really uh, research you know, what is this community about? What are the assets of this community? And how can we help this community rebrand itself? So they go into communities that are struggling. Um, they actually went to Matewan um, several years ago. Uh, this past year, they've worked with Pineville, West Virginia. So it's, it's a very um, hands-on, like I said, tangible project where um, they, they help a community from the ground up. Uh, figure out, you know, wh how does it want to move itself forward? And um, so I encourage you to check out Pineville, West Virginia's new um, branding that they just unveiled this semester. She's been working on that all year. Um, and, and actually, she also works with, I believe, public health on um, helping. Uh, uh, it's a grant around the opioid epidemic and, and going into communities and kind of um, helping them um, with a you know, a strategic communications kind of plan um, around that. So that could be another avenue that you might explore with um, with public health mm -hmm. in your background. Mm -hmm. 
don't know if someone has something different in mind. Yeah. So um, yeah, the, the National uh, Communication Association has an environmental communication division. We do. And there are uh, lots of scholars doing all kinds of different uh, uh, projects and research in that area. Um, and uh, a good bit of it has to do with the kind of intersection between public health and environmental issues and uh, social marketing and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, there is the International Environmental Communication Association. They have a journal uh, called the uh, Journal of Environmental Communication. Uh, and then, as you heard, there are lots of other communication journals that do uh, special editions on environmental communication from time to time. Uh, the International Environmental Communication Association has an environmental communication division. Uh, and the Western States uh, Communication Association has an environmental communication division. Uh, so that's the sort of short answer. The long answer is I'll give you my card and you can email me <laughs> and I can try to hook you up with more specific uh, people and projects. The, um, I would add to that great list, um, the Rhetoric Society of America, RSA, they have a act, very active um, environmental communication group. It's a biennial conference where um, they run the conference um, every other year, but in the off year they, they run workshops um, that um, graduate students and faculty can participate in, and there's almost always at least two seminars dedicated to environmental communication, and it's it's the the need is starting to get so specialized that they'll get into um, uh, communication and say animal studies, um, environmental communication and food studies, environmental communication and so it's it's starting to get um, um, people are recognizing the the need to specialize even more to address all of the, the issues. So I would check out RSA if you're interested. <clears throat> Rhetoric Society of America. And I I want to say that um, the the article that I just co-authored, as I mentioned, was based um, a lot on the framework that Pete and his group developed. Um, and wrote about, but it was also based on the work of Shannon Bell, a sociologist at Virginia Tech who um, has been studying these issues for the last decade and has produced a lot of great work, including a recent book titled Our Roots Run as Deep as Ironwood. I think it's Ironwood. It's a plant. Um, I'm not great with plants. but um, And it is a profiles of about 10 women who have been uh, leading environmental justice movement in West Virginia, Kentucky, Kentucky and Southwest Virginia. And um, she's been doing great work. All right, well, I'll leave it for you guys. If you Do you have any parting thoughts or last, I was gonna say last words, but <laughs> probably, it's not appropriate. Um, anything you would like to leave them with? <laughs> put you on the spot, sorry. <laughs> I would just like to say thank you, uh, thank you. For, for inviting us and thank you to uh, mm -hmm. Department of Communication in West Virginia for hosting us. Thank you. Yeah, likewise, thank you. Definitely. Thank you very much. Yes, absolutely, I do wanna say thank you so much to Scott Myers and the Department of Communication here, uh, Communication Studies here at West Virginia University. I really appreciate all of you coming out and joining us this evening. And um, you know, feel free to stay after for a few minutes if you have additional questions. I know some of us don't like to say them out loud. So <laughs> thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it.